everybody, and welcome to Tuesday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Football Giants. I am John Schmelk, joined as always on Tuesday by Jonathan Casillas. JC, it's good to see you, man. Same here, brother. We've been hosting together in a while. I'm looking no. forward to this. Should be fun. And we're going to talk Wisconsin prospects. Later on in the show, not yes, not sir. not washed up former Wisconsin Badgers, oh, but damn. prospects coming into the draft that JC can now live vicariously through. Yeah, but sure. we're going to lead it off with a fellow Big Ten school in Penn State, and we're joined again like we have been the last few years by their play-by-play man on the radio, Steve Jones. Steve, you got John Schmelk and former linebacker Jonathan Casillas right here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Thanks so much for being with us. And I can tell you, Jonathan was a player. He can, he could get it done. I can Thank tell you, you that from firsthand knowledge. It's great to be with, with uh, both of you guys. I'm going to leave some of the defensive guys to JC. So I'm going to lead off with the guy that will likely be picked first from your group, though, based on, oddly, he seems to be falling. I don't quite know why. Let's start with Olu Fashionu, Steve, who, yeah. you know, to me, I still think is the smoothest pass protector in this class. It's weird, I think. When you rewatch him in the run game, he's on the ground a lot, which for a guy that's so athletic and coordinated is weird to me. Uh, but I see it on tape. It's there. So just your thoughts on Fashionu. I know he's coming off an injury in the offseason. I wonder if that held him back a little bit this year on what you saw from him on the field and whether or not you think, based on everything you've seen from so many good Penn State offensive linemen, that he's worth a top 10 pick. Yeah, Olu is a guy that I've seen probably two or three times in the last three weeks, and physically he's fine. So that's not an issue with him right now. Uh, look, this this guy is, if you want your quarterback and he's right-handed and you want his back protected, this is the guy you want. You're talking about long arms, great footwork. Uh, he can take somebody off the edge. He can turn them. He doesn't give up pressures. I mean, it's not just more than he doesn't give up sacks. He doesn't give up pressures. In the run game, though, you're right. He has to be better in the run game. Or if you want to get that, you know, those key yards uh, at some point along the way, you need to have that guy to, to move them off the ball. Can he move them off the ball? Yeah. Is he? Does he need to be more consistent at it? Yes. So I would say, as a pass protector, he's better than Alt. You, you could argue Alt might be better as a, as a run guy. But this is such a pass-happy league. You need to have somebody with that kind of extension, that kind of footwork, that can make the plays that he makes. And you have no questions about him, just because we're not exposed to these guys like you are. Good dude off the field, good dude in the locker room, smart guy, all that stuff that we can't see. He checks all those boxes. Let me put it this way. He came back last year because he values education so much. He would have been a top-ten pick last year. His parents are very much into the education component of it, as is he. So he's got his degree and moving forward. It's a high-character guy that you want to be around all the time. Uh, we're going to jump to the defensive side. You'll handle offense. I'll, I'll, handle, I'll handle defense. I might have one follow-up on Chop. <laughs> okay, ahead. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, prospect Chop Robinson, one of the coolest names, of course, out of all prospects coming out, Chop Robinson, uh, tested very well. Uh, where do you see him falling at? Because – you talk about, you know, pass, the NFL's being a pass-happy league. You know, definitely you're, you're correct about that. On the other side of it, though, you got to have great pass rushes. You got to have get, great guys on the back end, you know, covering these great wide receivers that are now getting paid $30, $40 million a year. Michael Parsons is a guy from Penn State, and that's somebody that they're comparing Chop to. I don't really see it, but – he has some explosion there, so maybe that's the comparison. Where do you see Chop falling at in his draft? Yeah, Mike and Parsons and Chop are different players, yeah. Jonathan. You're absolutely right about that. They're also different body types. They may be similar in terms of maybe weight. But Chop is a guy that at one point played linebacker at Maryland, and they moved him to defensive end here. But the plan was when he came here, they were going to make him a defensive end. So that brings a couple of elements to it. Number one, the ability on the outside to get that pressure because of the takeoff you talked about. But also the fact that he played linebacker at one point in his career. (laughs) He is not uncomfortable at dropping back into pass coverage when you want the zone blitz. So he brings that kind of versatility to the table that really helps. So if you want to be able to disguise what you're doing in zone blitz, as a former linebacker, he understands the proper depth of a drop to make on a play like that. But primarily he's going to be a guy that's going to attack the quarterback, and it's going to be his speed, quickness, and strength that will make a difference for a team. Why do you think, Steve, that 
the athleticism and the immense physical skills we see on tape and on the field didn't translate to more production? Well, the production part is, I think you gotta, when you watch a tape of him, watch how many times that, that he is flushing somebody out of there. It's more than just how many sacks that you get and tackles for losses along the way. It is, now I've got this guy running for his life and he's off his spot. And that's what Chop was doing. He was getting to people in such a way where now he changed how an offense was playing. He also got chipped a fair amount of times. They kept the tight end against him, and he still was able to make plays off the edge. He, uh, when you talk to Manny Diaz, who was Penn State's defensive coordinator, now the head coach at Duke, he will tell you he thought Chop was the MVP of the defense, despite wow. what the numbers say. Can he play the run? He can absolutely play the run. That's not an issue. Again, he's got that quickness and strength, so he can close down on the run. And he can also, yeah, you want to you want to try to run away from him, he'll catch you from behind. Is he a is he a early? Does he have an early draft grade? Like so is Chop? he a? Is he a first, second, yeah, third? Uh, yeah. No, I, I think he'll be mid to late first. Okay. Oh, well, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think John's got it right. Mid to late first sounds <laughs> like what we've been hearing too, Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, you. We say here with the Giants, you, you, there's you can add like pass rushers. You need pass rushers. You know, in this day and age, right. you don't need two. You need three. You need four on the outside. That's not even included in the interior. You need three or four guys rushing right. on the outside. So, you know, they're a high, you know, commodity here in the NFL. So, best of luck to him. Now, the other pass rusher you guys had, Adisa Isaac, a Brooklyn yeah. guy. So, not too far from here. Canarsie, you know? baby. Yeah, man. So, can you, yeah. tell, can you tell us something about him? Well, high character guy, which I'll get to in a moment. This guy, uh, you know, I I have one of the votes for the All Big Ten team, including voting for Defensive Player of the Year of the Big Ten. I actually cast my vote. I know what I just said about Chop. I cast my vote for Deuce Isaac. Uh, Isaac is somebody who really developed into a big time player off the edge, and he had big time production to go with it. The part that Jack Ham and I marveled about consistently is that what I just talked about with Robinson, his ability to drop in a zone blitz and actually play legitimately like a guy in a zone area was so impressive because he was not a linebacker coming in. He developed that on his own. And that's what impressed us about him and his ability to get off the edge one-on-one against somebody. He is, he's a guy that can, I think be a very good production guy in the league won't be a first round pick but it'll be a good production guy he is from a family uh, his mom is is incredible but all of his siblings are nonverbal, and he has been somebody that has been incredible with 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 his family wow understanding it uh it is really is a great it really is a great story because he's the only one of the siblings that's verbal and he has a huge heart and i think it's something that if you're looking for a high character guy who can play he's in that category let me ask you about kaylin king steve because i watched him last summer getting ready for the year and i loved what i saw i thought he could be a first round pick ball production all over the place cover one-on-one then i watched his tape this year and i thought it was a guy a different person put on his uniform Hmm. He did not look like the same guy to me. He It wasn't people talking about the Marvin Harrison game. It wasn't just the Marvin Harrison game. He just did not get his hand on the football much this year, and I thought he struggled a lot in man-to-man coverage. Is, is he struggling mentally a little bit? Did he deal with an injury? What the heck happened to Kalen King this year? He, he was healthy the entire season. I'll tell you the area where he improved. He actually improved against the run. Uh, that's where he improved, and he was a good, solid tackler against the run. On pass plays, uh, you, know, you mentioned the Harrison game, and there was a play where uh, Curtis Jacobs uh, ripped the ball out of the hands of McCord and he ran it back for a touchdown. It got called back because King was called for holding. And here's the issue, and Jonathan, you know what I'm talking about here. You angle yourself in coverage in such a way where you're trying to, if it, you're not taking it to yourself, you're trying to force them to where the help is. He forced Harrison to where the help was. They had it covered, and he still grabbed him. Like, in the holding penalty, took the touchdown off the board. Um, I think that, you know, Johnny Dixon, in a lot of ways, on the opposite side, had a better season than Kalen King. I agree did. with you. I'm uh, with you. Uh, and and I think that Kalen, but he's also a prospect that when you watch him play the year before, that tells you what he can be. 
And I think that in the right system, he can be a really good player for somebody. And I thought his initial testing at the Combine was uh, okay. I thought his testing at the Pro Day here at Penn State was excellent. Out of all of those corners that you guys have, you guys got three potential corners that could get drafted. And I'm going to throw Curtis yeah. Jacobs in there too, your linebacker. Which one of those yeah. guys can have success on special teams? Because now they're bringing, they're trying to bring back kickoff now. And when I played, we were covering a lot of kicks. And a lot of yeah. kicks were brought out the end zone. Well, I used to play for the yeah. Saints. We were averaging 30-something points a game. I'm covering six, seven, eight kickoffs in a game. A lot of running. And yeah. maybe it's not sure. like that now, you know, coming back. But kickoff is going to be brought back finally, which I think right. is a huge part of the game. So I think there's going to be a lot more emphasis. And now that the roster is expanding as well, I think more emphasis is going to be put on drafting players specifically for special teams, like the Giants are doing yeah. in free agency, bringing guys specifically to play uh, special teams? Yeah, that's a great question because uh, all, all three of the corners here at one point or another played on special teams. Uh, uh, King, Dixon, and then Daquan Hardy. The guy that can be the special team star of the three of those guys would be Daquan Hardy. He may not be the biggest in stature, but if you want a guy that can return punts he can return punts. He brought two back for touchdowns this year, had a third one called back. But he also is a guy that they used in a gunner situation on the outside in terms of tracking down punts. And the same thing, they also used King and Hardy at one point on kickoff coverage to go to your point. So those are the guys that I would say Hardy would be the number one guy as a special teams guy. King would probably be second. Dixon would be third. Let me just follow up on Curtis Jacobs real quick. For Giant fans don't yeah, know, his please. favorite player growing up was Brandon Jacobs because his last yep. name was Jacobs, so yeah, he yeah, just yeah. rooted for Brandon. <laughs> I had a chance to talk yep. to him at the uh, Shrine game. Really nice kid, really smart kid. I had a lot of, I had a lot of fun talking to him. Uh, my question for you, Steve, on, on Jacobs, he's kind of like that throwback off-ball linebacker that you just don't have as much of that have anymore. He's a great athlete. Do you see him yeah. as a Mike? Is, is, is he going to be the guy that, that wears that green dot and communicates with the coach? Or is he more of you either Will or Sam that's going to play off a middle linebacker? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, he wore 23 here, so if the Giants get him, does he wear 27? Uh, so, <laughs> it's free, uh, I think. I'm not sure if he has 27 right now. I have to check that, actually. Uh, but uh, just th throwing that out there, this is an every down linebacker. Uh, he's more of a will than he yeah. is a Mike. But he, but here in the system at Penn State, you have to learn all three spots. So when Penn State was going with the uh, with their uh, what they call the penny package, three down line but two linebackers, he was the guy that was in that middle area there learning that spot. But for the most part, he was the guy that was the will, weak side of the field. Uh, really, a, a, I think. You don't want to take him off the field because he can cover the pass, excellent against the run, and has the recognition skills that you need at that linebacking spot. Jack Ham's really high on him. If Jack Ham's high on him, that will tell you about what he thinks about him as a linebacker. Yeah, that's that's good. Uh, and I don't think you addressed him. You just kind of spoke about the corners before in regards to special teams. Um, yeah. How do you think he'll fare in special teams? Because, you know, he got the size. He has the measurables. And from what you're saying, it sounds like he'd be a good player no matter where you put him at. Oh, yeah. Jacobs? Jacobs on special teams would be terrific because he can run. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's a big part of it. He can run. And, and, you know, Jonathan, you talk about all the sprints you had to make up and down the field on plays. Jacobs is the kind of guy that would be a really good special teams player for somebody, whether it's in punt coverage or in kickoff coverage. Are you good switching on offense here, JC? Yeah, let's you go. Good? All right, I want to go to Theo Johnson here, Steve. If you build a tight end in the lab, he kind of looks like Theo Johnson. He's 6'6", <laughs> six, six, he's 260, uh, he ran really well, his athletic testing was off the charts. Yet when I watch the tape, I, I just don't see it quite come all the way together. Well, that's what part, in part because Penn State run, run, has been running the last couple of years a two tight end system. Mm. So when you're spreading the ball out like that, I mean, you know, with both tight ends out there at the same time, so they kind of work off of each other. Uh, Theo Johnson is really a, has become a terrific blocker, excellent hands, good route runner. Look at Brenton Strange, who was a second-round pick by the Jacksonville Jaguars. That's the prototype to the type of tight end that Penn State's putting in the league. And we're going to have the same conversation next year about Tyler Warren when we talk about it. But he is, uh, with the size, the strength, 
everything that he has, he's going to be an excellent tight end in the league moving forward. I mean, he may not be the number one guy out of the gate, but eventually he'll be somebody's number one. Yeah, and if he can block at all, you know, just a little bit. Can he, Steve? You don't you don't have to block yes, that yes, much at that position yes, cuz they could do things right. with you. But that's good that right. if that he can block. I think you know with his uh measurables and and you know his size people give a lot of you know uh you know pay, they pay attention to potential a lot, you know, and the potential for him I think is hey, very and high. Tight end is a testing position. Oh that's yeah, for sure. Is. That's what it is yeah, now. Yeah, for sure. Um who we got next? You want to go uh, Hunter Norzad, the center? Okay. Steve, what do you think about him? A lot of people think he might not get drafted till day three, but i gotta be, I got to be honest with you. You watch him. He looks like he could develop into an NFL star to me. Well, the key with Norzad is he can play multiple positions. He can, he's, uh, can play guard and he can play center. Because of that, NFL teams are going to really like that because they value on the offensive line that if you are not a starter, do, the, do you have the ability to play multiple spots? He does. And when they took him from guard and made him the center last season, you know, that's the guy that has to make out all the calls. Well, you know, if I'm going to pick out a guy that has to make all the calls in the offensive line, I'd like to pick a guy with a Cornell degree, and he's got a (laughs) Cornell degree. (laughs) Okay. So you do that. He's powerfully built. Um, He's fought through some injuries. That's what's hurt him on his testing. Is he's been a little bit banged up in the testing. He's a lot better now, so that that's a plus. But the versatility where he can play any one of those three spots in the middle is really going to help him. That's awesome. Caden Wallace, a Robbinsville, New Jersey guy. I'm a Jersey guy, so yep. I got to ask about the Jersey yep. guy. Where do you see him fall at in the draft? Is he a, is he a left tackle, right tackle? Uh, more right tackle. Uh, could he, would he have the potential to maybe play guard? Yes, he can. But he was a right tackle here at Penn State. Uh, there were a lot of people that were not in his corner for a couple of years watching him play. I'm talking about fans. He's coming off without question his best season. I mean, his best season by a wide margin was this past season. And my understanding is he tested really well, which has helped him. Uh, again, there's the possibility that if you draft him as a tackle, and you need him to play guard, he can do it. It's that versatility that is so big and so valued in the league yep. among offensive linemen who aren't starters, and he's got that just like Norzad does. Anyone we didn't mention that we should have, Steve? Anybody you didn't mention we should have? Um, I think we covered pretty much everybody um, that is going to be a drafted player for Penn State. I mean, it's a good group. I think they're going to get probably 10 guys probably drafted or at least signed out of this group, and that that's, uh, tells you about the depth yeah. that Penn State has. Yeah, no question, Stephen. Last year, I remember at the end of the interview, I actually asked you about Olu Fashion, because I love this tape last year, mm-hmm. and your point, he could have been a top 10 pick. Who's the next big guy that's going to be, we're talking about, coming out of Penn State at this time next year? Well, it depends on what you want, because uh, let's face it, a guy like Nicholas Singleton, for example, is a great running back, but we all know what the running back value is right now. Yeah. Yep. In, in the league, and that, that, that comes in, into play. Uh, when I look at, like, defensively, for example, a guy that we'll see how he plays out this year, but Abdul Carter is a guy that is going into his junior year, would be draft eligible a year from now, who is doing the same thing that Chop did. He was an inside linebacker. They're not making him a defensive end. Mm. He's going to get a long, hard look, I think, by people next year, and he will be draft eligible, and he'll have a decision to make after the season's uh, over with. Steve, good stuff, my friend. Tell the folks where they can find you and anything that you want to promote. Nope, everything's good. It's great to be with you guys, as always. Steve, awesome stuff. Steve. Steve Jones, you can hear him on Penn State Radio calling the Nittany Lions ball game. Steve, good stuff, man. All right, JC, we got about 10 minutes here, so maybe we'll take a couple calls. Do you want yeah, to try to squeeze it. them in? All right, yeah. let's squeeze a couple calls in at 201-939-4513. I've seen those lines blinking that whole interview, so someone's really desperate to talk to probably you. you think? Not do you me. think it's going to be one of our callers? Who do you think it is? I don't know. No one's there right now. We'll see if somebody I pops up. it's Wilson. You're going to go Wilson? Yeah. I feel like he calls when I'm on. Now, Charlie, Does he call all the time? Charlie's very annoyed. I haven't Recently, spoke to Charlie. So. I mean, I haven't been on as consistently Man. as I have been like I'm, during the I'm season. I think either Charlie or Wilson is missed my bet. I like it. Could be Len. Let's see. We get Len sometimes, yeah. too. But we definitely had somebody calling in during that home interview, so I make sure we try to get to them. No, it's not. It's not one of the regulars. No. 
So we're going to get to him in just a second here. Let's go to DJ in Virginia, Pierce, and you can screen one more. DJ, what's going on? Hey, what's up, guys? Love the show. Thank you. What's, what's on up, your mind? DJ? So I just had two quick questions. Um, so one of them is I'm just curious about the roster construction of the Giants and the way the NFL is going. Sure. I'm curious, like, because I know with Dable's system, they like guys who are a little bit smaller and, you know, guys who can separate and get open. But with the way the NFL is going and guys are being a lot smaller and guys are, you know, running a lot faster, would it kind of behoove the Giants to maybe go in a different direction and maybe go bigger guys, stronger guys, you know, more, you know, I know it's boring, but more run-based, you know what I mean? You mean at, at receiver or <laughs> just You're talking general? about overall, right? You're talking overall. about overall. Yes, and, overall you know what? in general. I, I actually, I actually heard that. You know, uh, not too long ago. I don't know if it was w- within us. You know, the, the Giants, but you know, we the last what ten years. The, the, there's no question that the, the league has moved to more of a pass happy league. Where you know, even when I entered the league in 2009, back then you had to have a great running back, a good offensive line, and yeah, you had to have a good quarterback. But you didn't even you didn't need a great quarterback. Right. You know, you needed a good quarterback, and a lot of linemen were bigger. They they weren't as athletic. <laughs> And I was hearing that possibly because everything has been lighter, guys, more speed, that if you you start going the other direction, it will give you, you know, some advantages. And I agree with that, DJ. I think specifically, I still think you're going to want the speed of wide receiver. I don't think perimeter speed is ever going to change. But when you talk about a running game, and we've already seen this, outside zone is slowly getting put back out of style, right? Because all these teams design their defenses to stop the outside zone with all the Shanahan guys. Well, if you watch the Rams now, Mm -hmm. they don't run outside zone anymore. They run all gap scheme. They run all duo Mm -hmm. power stuff in the interior of the line. So I think if you're building out your guards and centers, I'm all in favor. And look what the Rams did. They signed two big power guards this year in free agency. I like the idea of less zone run game and more of a power yeah, downhill run game. In your face. Go after those 225-pound linebackers. Make them take on yeah. a fullback. Make them take on a pulling guard. All of those speed See rushers on the outside. So, yep. DJ, I think in, in that limited portion, yes. And I do think because the other positions are shrinking, I do think teams are trying to size up Inside. at defensive tackle a little mm-hmm. bit to protect those smaller linebackers. Right. So, yes, I think at those specific positions, I think you're right. Okay. Because, yeah, because it also wears them down. You know, over a game, you know, those guys wearing down on you, yeah, you, you get tired. No, I'm with you. Uh, what, what, what's, and, what's the second part of your question, Steve? And, and my second part is I'm, DJ, I'm trying to figure out exactly how the Eagles are doing it. So, I understand, like, you know, with how they're doing it, like, physically with the void years and all that. But say, for instance, like the Son Reddick. Like, they have the Son Reddick on the last year of his contract. And uh, I don't know how many void years he had on the end of his contract, but so if they traded him, do the void years go with his contract, or do they still are they still responsible for the void years? And I'll take your answer off the air. I believe the void years stay. Yeah, because they're just taking his contract. So whatever his contract is, they just take the contract, the new team that he gets traded to. Yes. Um, <clears throat> for example, in 2024. For the Jets, they took on his $14 million base salary, right? Let me look at the Eagles page now. And let me see what they're on the hook for for Reddick this year. I'm just out of curiosity. I don't know how his contract was structured. I don't have that. I didn't have that, memor- <laughs> I didn't have that memorized, uh, not surprisingly. <laughs> uh, so Hassan Reddick on the Eagles 2024 cap, JC, $21 million. To not play for them. To not play for them. (laughs) And that's, to your point, DJ, when people talk about kicking the can down the road and, oh, just restructure all the contracts, back them up, it's all right, don't worry about it. $21 million cap hit. Dead on the Eagles cap. You're going to pay some time. You're going to pay some time. And that's going to happen with all of these deals. Yeah. With Jalen Hurts' deal, eventually, or, you know, they'll probably just, if he keeps playing well, they'll just extend him. Yeah. But all these guys, you put these void years on their contracts, you're going to have a ton of dead money. For example, I'm going to give you just one example. Lane Johnson, all right? I'm looking at it right now. Lane Johnson right now has a 34-year-old in his 2024 contract year, right? He has a $15 million cap hit this year 
a $1.2 million base salary. Dang. Right? But he is... He has $45 million in dead cat money this year. Gosh. Next year, it's $30 million of dead cat money if they cut him. The year after that, at age 36, it's still $19 million of dead cat money if they cut him. So this is how the Eagles are doing it. They figure, look, we have our window. Yeah. We have Jalen Hurts, and his money doesn't kick in. I still think for another year or two right. before his big money base salaries kick in. So that's how they're doing it. And they're saying, we're going to try to win now, and if we don't, and three years, we're going to have to tear the whole thing down yep. for a year or two and start over like the Rams have done the last couple of years. Right. You know, people say, oh, well, the Rams did it. Look, they were pretty good last year already. Well, just you wait until Matthew Stafford retires. And then you tell me how good the Rams are going to yeah. be. Yeah, no, I hear And you. Aaron Donald just retired. Right. We're going to see. We're going to see. We're going to see. Like, it's yep. going to take a couple of years for that team to rebuild. Like, yeah, they had one good year last year. They were carried by Puka Nakua, who was a really good draft pick, mm -hmm. and Matthew Stafford, who was still Matthew Stafford. Yep. But when Stafford disappears in a year or two and Don Donald just retired, that team's going to have problems. Yeah, unless they start addressing it, you know, free agency through the draft. And and just for, look at the Saints. The Saints are not able to build a roster because they keep pushing all their money back. It's yeah. just the way it is. It's like once Drew Brees basically stepped down, you know, and it's it's hard to recover from somebody, like, leaving like that. Like, I had no you know, idea this Lane Johnson contract was this ridiculous. I mean, that's a chance yeah, that's he retires insane. after this year. They have $30 million of their cap money. Sheesh. Some, they figured it out somehow, though, no, in terms they, of the product again, that they put on the field. They had all these void years and everything, and that makes it complicated. Maybe he retires. Some of those go away. I don't know the answer to that because a lot of this stuff is beyond me in terms of – I'm going to have to ask our cap guy upstairs how that works with void yeah. years because it's complicated, and that's another – I had the things all figured out. So these void years started coming in. It's a little <laughs> bit more complicated. So just something to keep And I was here. generic because I was undrafted, and my contract didn't look like any of these no, numbers that I'm looking did, at in did front did of me. <laughs> but that tell you, $15 million cap hit for Lane Johnson, just, and they, their base salaries are all low, just $1.2 million. Yeah. They put it on the bon they put all pushing, bonus structure, yeah. and they put bonuses down the road that kick in and – Again, I'd have to look more into the details of the contract. Which is, but. which is both good for the player, too, because it puts money in their pocket right now. Yep, sure. You know, and, and there's nothing better than that. You know, like, it's cool having a nice high salary, but if you get most of that in a signing bonus before you play, you feel a little bit happier no about question. that. <laughs> I'd rather have my money today and a hamburger for oh, tomorrow, man, you know what listen. I'm saying? All right, let's go to uh, Donnie in Queens. Donnie, I hope, he didn't get, hope I didn't get you in trouble last week keeping you on too long, bro. <laughs> no, nah, it was all good. I, okay. I just I I figured I'd better take the initiative and get off before that happens. Yeah, very good idea, Donnie. What do you got today, my man? So I actually had a flight Friday night, so I saved the uh, mock draft you guys did for for the flight. Um, and I was sitting there scratching names off as you guys went myself to follow along, and I kind of got to that pick forty seven, and I've kind of felt this way all along. Is that I, I'm really excited about the value that's presenting itself there. Obviously, on draft night, anything can happen. A player falls, and you say, I can't believe he's here and whatnot. But I do feel like putting the quarterback thing aside, let's say the Giants take a receiver at six, you know, you're know, you taking a stab at a front-line player there. I do feel like if they could drop from 47 to, say, 57 to 60, maybe you pick up a late third. Uh, and then even at 70, drop into the middle of the third round, pick up a mid to late fourth, would, would be a good option for the Giants to maybe take a stab at, kind of building out the depth of the roster. and Yes, and Donnie, but honestly, things. the way that draft went, I'd be open to that because I think there's a number of corner safeties and interior defensive linemen that are all kind of okay. the same at that point, to be honest Correct. with you. So I would be fine moving down there, assuming, and I'm going to ask J JC about what he would do too, assuming you're not talking about the quarterback. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, we, no, I, I was. Go yeah, ahead, JJ. go ahead. No, you go, you go, you go. Yeah, I, I was, you know, I was saying at that point, um, you know, you're moving back. You guys are debating the corners. No, nobody really seemed to have any conviction on the player. It was just like, well, this guy or that guy, whatever the case may be. No, I've been you saying it, Donnie. Got... I, I've been saying on our last couple of huddles, I'm, maybe they haven't aired yet. I've recorded so many of these damn things. I don't know which ones I've said what on. But these corners are really hard to stack in rounds two and three, man. I don't have much space between them, to be honest with you. Correct. And I think, you know, when you look into rounds three and four, I, I'm a fan of taking players at positions that run in those rounds because there's more guys out there that can run than there are big physical guys that have the requisite size and strength to play the, the trench positions. So tight end, safety, corner, even running back. I think that's better than maybe sitting and picking at 47. Now, again, it takes somebody to have to want to trade up, but like in your case, you guys had Penix there. 
you know, maybe somebody wants to add him to the quarterback room. That would be a good idea. So j- just my thoughts on the, the, the entire exercise, and I'll hang up and listen to the rest. No, of I appreciate it, Donnie. And, J.C., I want to get your take now, okay? Yeah, I mean, look, there's no – there's. There's like a science to leading up to it, but there's no science in, in figuring out who's actually going to be a good football player in the NFL. Zero science. You know, like you, zero. there's science up to the draft, leading up to it, how you scout, how you look at guys, what you're looking for, but none of these guys are guaranteed to do anything in the NFL, and luck has to do with it. Uh, uh, being healthy has to do with it. Being actually capable to handle NFL playbooks had a lot to do with it. Look at last year. Who was the best re- rookie receiver last year? Puka Nakua, by far. Fifth round. And Tank Dell was, might have been the second or third best guy, like, and he was the fourth round. You know? I no, mean, and it's crazy. And that's a position that I feel like has been a lot of the uh, first round draft picks have been very good over the years with receivers, especially recently. You, you know, mm-hmm. but Puka Dukul, cool, best receiver by far in that class, he was a fifth round guy. So it's like it's it's it's. I would love to get as many draft picks as possible because you just never know. You might have a fifth rounder, sixth rounder, seventh rounder that play. I was undrafted. You know, and I played my rookie year. I never missed a game. I was always on an active roster. You know, so like you had a guy that was drafted the fourth round to, to the, the same year as me to the same team, and he barely played in the NFL. You know, like Aaron Curry, my year was drafted number two or three overall. He barely played in the NFL. He was one of the best prospects coming out. It's just so hard to predict. That's why I really don't follow college ball as much because I pay attention to the NFL because that's what matters. When I say matters, like I'm covering the NFL. You know, mm-hmm. when all the stuff leading up to the NFL, yeah, you did all of this stuff in college. You were good. You ran well. You tested well. You jumped high. Your hands are big. You're very strong. Okay, cool. How does that work in the NFL, and can you stay healthy? And in with your coaching staff, in that system, yeah. in that scheme, it's it's really, really hard. All right, I'm going to put you real <clears> quick before we get to our final guest here. We're going to do Wisconsin prospects. JC, the interesting thing to me is we did this mock draft, and you can sit there at 47. And I sat here and I tried to convince Datino and Lance to take Michael Penix. And I'm not a Michael, and I've had this argument with Charlie, I'm not a Penix in the top 10 guy, I'm not a Penix in the top 15 guy. I have a second round grade on him. That's where I think he belongs for various reasons. I don't have to get into all that. But if he's sitting there at 47, you don't got to move and you can add an arm like that to your quarterback room given the injuries Daniel Jones has dealt with. I would have a hard time saying no to that. Would you? Uh, Yeah, me too. Me too. Unless, you know, management here... Uh, Shane Dayball, unless they're just like when when I say like just X them off because of the injuries, because sometimes and, that happens. And that would honestly be a Ronnie Barnes decision. If Ronnie right. Barnes comes in and says, "Look, we don't think this guy is going to be able to play football in five years," then you can't draft him. Right. right, right. Like that's why he's not being talked about as a top ten quarterback because I think a lot of teams have X them off completely. Like they might have a high grade on him, but then somebody comes along and says, "But look at this. We don't do that. This is not what we're going to do. Yeah. We're mm-hmm. not going to invest." All of this money, because it is a lot when you're a first-round draft pick, especially in the top 10. And, the, and shoulders are da- are scary for quarterbacks. Yeah, for sure. Shoulders and are scary. Shoulder and knee, too. No, yeah. You know, and he, he go to one of these teams that, you know, doesn't have a great offensive line and he has to run, and you put them basically more at risk. You know, and everybody durability is different in the NFL. Lamar Jackson's, like, never been on the injury report. Right. And he runs all the time. Correct. So where, what would your priority then be? If we take the quarterback off the board, because I'm with you, I think mm-hmm. in that point value there was strong. Are you looking for corner, safety, defensive tackle? What's your priority there uh, to try to get a starting level player, which is what you want yeah. in the second round? Yeah. Well, I think because we have youth here uh, at the safety position, uh, Dane Belton, you got Pinnock. I think you could add a quality safety into that group. You can't go wrong in drafting corners and, and pass rushers. You know, and I think defensive linemen, I think the Giants, the Giants, the Giants have done a good job in bringing in defensive linemen uh, the past few years. Um, but you can't go wrong with none of those positions. You know, you need depth uh, in, in terms of on the back end. You need corners that can cover. You need your third corner has to be good. You know, you got to have at least two really good safeties and th- a third safety that can play for you if something happens or if you go a certain type of personnel matchups. For corner, do you prioritize that bigger perimeter guy or would you rather have a smaller guy that can maybe either do both but definitely play in the slot that's maybe a little bit faster? Give me somebody in the middle. 
Give me somebody in the middle. Not too small, not too big. Like, we had Jack Rabbit. We had Dominic Rogers so, from Artie. So I want like, somebody in the middle. Sounds like you want Max Melton from Rutgers. Who's yeah, why not? He's 5'11", yeah. 6 foot, runs a 4'4", four, 8'. Four, why not? Can play inside and outside. Can do a little bit of everything. Yeah, and he's a Jersey guy. And it's something about Jersey guys when they play for the New York teams. <laughs> All right, so I'm with you. I, I'm prioritizing corner there in round two. I think you're starting to get into the safeties there too because I think you might be able to get one of those top three or four safeties in round three if you want to go there. Uh, and then when would you attack running back? That's my last question for you. I don't know. I mean, if Braylon is around late. Like round know? four, that wouldn't be If he's around late, day. like I said, because he, he might would, slip because of the numbers. And, and he'd be a good match, I think, with Singletary and Eric Gray yeah. based on running style. Big Big, strong guy, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, coming in, if the Giants do address the running back position late, you know, they have to be, you know, viable option on special teams, and it doesn't have to be a returner, more of the coverage game, more of the, uh, you know, the return game, not as a returner, but more of a frontline blocker yeah. and stuff like that. So you always got to ask those type of questions because you just never know. You know, you never know, you know, guys come in and it's like, yeah, he's a, he was a decent running back, but he might be a stud special teams player in the league and play 12 years in the, in the league. Matthew Slater. Guys, just a <laughs> reminder, go subscribe to the Giants Huddle podcast. It features great interviews. We're doing all our draft interviews right now. Uh, a lot of good stuff up there. Over the weekend, Bruce Feldman dropped, covers college football. Bucky Brooks and Field Yates is up there. Uh, we got Dane Brugler, Brian Broadus going this week, Charles Davis going this week. Uh, we're going to have our mock draft on Friday with the reporters from different teams. And then I'm working on what we're going to have leading up to the draft uh, early next week as well. But go subscribe to the John Settle Podcast. As well as draft season, Tony Pauline and I are still going strong. We talk draft every week. You can find those podcasts on Giants.com, the Giants mobile app, or go to Giants.com slash podcast. Search for them on your favorite podcast platform. At Fran Apple Podcast, please leave a five-star positive review. All right, now it's time to get to our next guest. And now we welcome in our final guest of the show. It is Colton Bartholomew. Uh, he covers the Wisconsin Badgers for the Wisconsin State Journal, Madison.com, and you can find them on Twitter at CBartWSJ. Colton, you got John Schmelk and former Wisconsin linebacker Jonathan Casillas with us, literally wearing his Badger sweatshirt right now. Very excited to talk <laughs> about the Wisconsin players coming out in the draft, though. Wisconsin football looked a little bit different this year, man. It did not look like classic Wisconsin football. Yeah, they took a pretty hard left turn on what they were doing offensively the last, I don't know, three decades. <laughs> and trying to get to the, uh, the current college football norm. And a uh, little bumpy in the first year, and I, I think that you know, we're about halfway through spring practices right now, and we're seeing some improvements in terms of just guys knowing what they need to do. So it's uh, just going to come down to how well the, the players can, can get out there and get it done. So, yeah, definitely a, a 180 from, from what Badger fans are used to watching. Is that change the reason we're not seeing the same number of Wisconsin players coming out this year that we usually do? I think definitely that, that played a role into it. And then, obviously, I think that you look at the last few years, they've had some pretty good recruiting classes if you look at – you know, 19, 20, and 21, those would be those classes that would be um, in the, the in your upper classman years right now that you would be going into the NFL. But uh, a lot of those guys didn't end up panning out in the college uh, football world for whatever reason. You know, injuries, some of them, some of them transferred to other schools. So, yeah, just not as many Badger players are you know, matriculating the same way or at the same rate right now. And, you know, I know that's something that this coaching staff is really focused on getting back to because they they want to be seen as a development program that, you know, if you go to Wisconsin, you give them, you know, a few years at least, you're going to get to the NFL. So that's something they're very focused on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, Wisconsin has been known for churning out great running backs that have been very highly, highly successful in the NFL and offensive linemen. You know, there's no question about that there, you know, and I think that's the two guys that, you know, are the main guys coming out of Wisconsin this year. Uh, you got Tanner Bordellini and you got Braylon Allen. My question is because, of course, Braylon Allen's a talent. You know, he is, a, you know, a, a, a very uh, – a, like Wisconsin running back, you know, not maybe not that fast, maybe not that explosive, but you can give him 30 carries. He's going to be able to haul the load, you know, like he's done for three years. Uh, you know, big guy coming in. My question is, why did he not run the 40? He didn't run at the combine, yeah, was, and he, he kind of held it off to like pro day. He didn't run at pro day either. What's going on with that? Yeah, that was a little suspect as well. I didn't quite understand some of the reasoning there. So, uh, midway through last year, he, he suffered a high ankle sprain against Ohio State, and then he missed a few games because of that. Comes back at the end of the year, helps Wisconsin beat Nebraska and then Minnesota, and then sits out the bowl game as he prepares for the draft. And I, 
imagine when that all went down, I figured, okay, ankle's not 100%, not going to risk it in the bowl game, and then just getting ready for the combine and all that. And then he doesn't run the 40 at the combine. I figure it's going to happen at the pro day. And then he just said that he never – his ankle's about – as close to 100% as it has been since the injury, but he just wasn't at a point in his training time to be able to you know, train to run the 40, and then he didn't want to put out a time that would put people in question of his speed. And when he said that, it, it kind of made sense, but I'm also like, well, they question your speed because you didn't run it. Right. Like, there's kind of a flip side of that coin, too. So, you know, he's not going to be a 4-5 or a 4-4 or a 4-3 like four, 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 guy. You know, I've heard from guys in the program that, Four or five ish was kind of where he was sitting when he was training throughout his uh, summer between sophomore and junior season. So I think that's somewhere around what he would run. So he's not going to be that burner speed guy. He's not going to be that big home run hitter. But a guy like Braylon Allen still has a role in the NFL, which is obviously uh, passing has become you know the most important thing. But to be able to have a running back that you can trust in short yardage, on the goal line, that type of thing, there's still a place for a guy like that in the NFL. It's just where do teams kind of slot that into their draft plans is kind of a big question. You know, it's funny. When I went back and watched him, Colton, obviously you've watched a lot more of his running back snaps than I have. I went back and I, and I watched, you know, you know, you know, maybe 100 snaps, something like that, a couple games. And even though he's, you know, 6'1", 235, really big guy, I don't feel like he ran – with that type of force and physicality inside, like I would expect from a guy that size. And again, I didn't go back and watch the last two years. I only watched this year. But is that accurate or am I not seeing it right? No, I think you're correct on this past season because I think part of the difference with this offense was there was so much more space with the team. Just formationally, there was so much more space between how the offensive line aligned, uh, what they were doing in, I think, he had the biggest challenge on the offense of adjusting to it because they brought in a new quarterback that had been used to, you know, a spread air raid type of system. Offensive linemen, you know, at the end of the day, yes, there was more space, but there was really still zone power, things that they were all kind of used to. He really had to adjust his landmarks of where he's looking on a run play, the types of things he's trying to do, uh, finding holes. And, you know, one of the things I think he, because he's so young in his running back career, decisiveness has always been kind of a, a question mark in my mind is like when when do you decide where the hole is and if it's not quite there are you just going to try to run through somebody and make it at times throughout the first two years he would do that and he was pretty successful with it i think with this last season in the offensive change he resorted back to you know waiting for a hole to open a little bit too long maybe not trusting quite what he was seeing as blocks developed and i think you saw a little bit too much dancing before the line of scrimmage but then there are some games, you know, I think the Minnesota game, the last game of the regular season last year in particular, he really just said, I'm going for it, and this is going to be my last college game. I think that's where you saw some of that power and some of the, the better runs that he had of the whole year against a decent Minnesota defense, uh, even though it had some of its struggles as well. So I think the freshman and sophomore year, Braylon Allen had a little bit more of that power you would expect for him to have at his size. And then the adjustment here in this last season – slow him down a little bit, I think, when he got the ball. Yeah, and, and to, to be honest, those things, uh, you know, not running a 40, uh, not having as productive as his uh, junior year as he did his freshman, so- sophomore years, might actually hurt him a little bit in the draft, possibly having him slide to the later rounds. But if he does get, you know, slides to the later rounds and does get picked up in, as a late round draft pick, he will be one of the biggest steals of the draft because I don't think, look, I, 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 you know, I don't watch too much Wisconsin football as I used to when I played football, but I watch a little bit more than, than uh, a Schmelk the last, uh, you know, few <laughs> years. And, you know, he's been a beast. You know, I, I don't think you can, you know, look at his film and be like, oh, he's not a quality running back. He's definitely a quality running back. And by back. the way, <clears throat> you, you made this point, Colton. He's only just turned young. 20. Just turned he 20. reclassified in high school, right? So to, to, to JC's point, this is a guy that also is extremely young. He's only 20 yep. years old. Extre- extremely young. And if he happens to slide in the draft, which potentially, you know, the things that are happening with him his senior year, the injury that happened, the, uh, 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 the production, and then also not running a 40 that might turn some heads but if he's a guy that gets drafted late he'll be one of the biggest steals of the draft because I think this guy you know if he could be a second you know a second string running back but you know 
Sometimes second string running backs snap off. They get 20 carries and all of a sudden they're like, oh, this guy can actually play some football. Yeah. And I see Braylon Allen kind of fit into that mold. Yeah, no, I'm with you guys. Like you mentioned, he's 20, just turned 20 in uh, January. I believe he's the youngest player in the entire draft class. Mm-hmm. And when you look at this, where the NFL is at right now, I don't, there are not too many teams that are just saying, here is our one running back. This is our, yeah. our bell cow. This is the guy that's getting the ball all the time. And when you have a guy like Brown Allen with the size that he has and some of the skill sets that he could you know, continue to develop, I think that he'll be a nice complement to a team that maybe has a little bit more of a slasher or a burner type of running back. You know, be that little bit more of a hammer, short yardage type of situational guy, and then ease some of the load off. And we, we know that there's just a kind of a movement in the NFL that if you're not going to have like a star running back to, you know, just kind of have a committee and have some multiple options to throw at a defense, I think that's where he fits in really well. And I think the big thing for him is finding the right scheme fit uh, as an, like, an offense that he joins because I don't think you're going to succeed a ton if you're asking him to get to the edge all that much. I think his number one kind of strength is, you know, a, a power gap type of scheme. So if he goes to the right team that has that, I think he's going to be in a good situation. If, you know, that's not great schematic fit right away, then some or more of those questions will pop up for him. But, you know, that's really kind of a thing you could say about a lot of draft uh, eligible players is if you go to the right system, you're going to be more successful. And then if you don't, there's going to be some struggles that, you know, get maybe unfairly tacked to, to your skill set. Before we jump to Bordellini here, I'll let JC do that. Isaac Garendo was a Wisconsin running back that was there, transferred, played at Louisville last year. Colton, and similar size-wise to Braylon Allen, but he tested extremely well. What was your experience with Garendo in Wisconsin? Yeah, the tough, the, the wild thing for me was Isaac Garendo just had the worst injury luck I think I've ever seen covering this team. You know, uh, it was Braylon Allen's freshman year, so 2021. They're warming up for the Illinois game, and then something happens on a play after Grendo takes a handoff that he got his foot stepped on, and he had a Liz Frank injury that knocked him out for the rest of his season. Oh, and then he had another injury. Yeah, he had another injury in 2022. And he's a – you mentioned how well he tested. He is one of the fastest players that Wisconsin's ever had, especially at that size. I think the problem with him early on was being that, that kind of track star – that he was in high school. It had some of those more like track and type of running injuries. So, like hamstrings always seemed to be an issue for him early in his career. So a ton of credit goes to Rendo for figuring that out as a senior, uh, having a really good season for Louisville, uh, especially late in the year. I think he had a, a huge uh, game to help them uh, get to a pretty high bowl game. And then for him, I think one thing that Wisconsin struggled with was obviously the injuries, but he was so solid as a receiver. He actually came in recruited as a receiver. They quickly moved him to running back. But he was so solid as a receiving option out of the backfield that that's kind of where he got pigeonholed. And then I think he showed as he got throughout his career that more touches is going to get him a more impactful situation. So I think he's a guy that's going to have a really nice NFL career as long as he can stay healthy because he has a lot of the skill set that the NFL wants now that – speed to the edge and be able to run, outrun people down the sideline and then catching the ball out of the backfield as well. So I think he's got a lot of promise ahead of him. So now we move on to the trademark of uh, Wisconsin, right? Tanner Bordellini. Linebacker. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We've had some good ones and you know, since, since I played there <laughs> for sure. Um, but look, when I came out of college, uh, Joe Thomas was the number two overall pick the year before I left Wisconsin. And, you know, athletic guy, dominant guy, had a tremendous NFL career, possibly going down as a top five, you know, left tackle in the NFL. And Tanner Bordelini is more of an inside interior guy, playing a lot of center, playing some guard here. But what I see from him, he's a very athletic guy. He looks like he's a natural bender. He can move very well. I mean, his his times, his 40-yard dash was, was average, but his short shuttle was amazing. Four two eight in a short shuttle, like that's like that's like really good. That's like defensive end type good. numbers right there, you know. So, you know, where do you see him fitting at? Do you think he's more of a center? You know, more of that uh, uh, Jason Kelsey athletic, maybe undersized center that can get up on these bigger guys a lot quicker. Because I think I see great technique from him and great uh, athleticism from him as well. Yeah, no, you're 100 percent right there. I mean, when you look at what he can be in the NFL, it's really a question of what the team needs because I think if he adds 15, 20-ish pounds, he could be a long-term guard and use that, that athleticism you mentioned to get up to the second level to be an elite-level puller. And then if he plays center, I think he stays around the same weight that he's at right now, right around that 300 mark. 
And then is that kind of athletic, can be the guy that jumps out to a blitzing linebacker on the outside if you need him to, uh, can do a lot of things where, you know, you're starting to see NFL teams pull centers more often now, and that was something that Wisconsin did in its old system in particular uh, with Bordellini quite a bit. So I think the, the thing that's the big question for him is how much more consistent can he make his snaps? That was something that really kind of hampered him this last season here at Wisconsin. The snaps were just inconsistent and not quite fast enough most of the time. So he, he was playing out of necessity because of some injury situations here at Wisconsin. But I think he's going to be able to be a long-term pro, whichever spot the team wants him at, because you mentioned that athleticism, but the technique, uh, if he stays healthy, especially with his lower body, like he does a lot of his work with his feet, getting – under guys because he's got that, that ability to bend and uses his leverage really well. Uh, I think as long as he stays healthy there and then gets just a little bit stronger upper, with his upper body uh, to sustain some of the blocks that he's going to need to in the NFL, he's going to be a long-term pro. And like you said, like Wisconsin's got that reputation that even with some of the changes they've had here, you know, he had three offensive line coaches in his last three seasons, uh, but they all have still hammered home some of the techniques that kind of made Wisconsin known and, uh, that's something that's going to help him be ready to play right away, I think, as long as a team kind of has a distinct plan for him right away and doesn't ask him to be a hybrid and just kind of lets him be either a guard or a center right away. Final one for me, Colton, and JCO just ask you if there's anyone else left that you like. Um, I think it's instructive for a guy like Bordelini that, to your point, you've seen him in a bunch of different systems now, right? So. Where did he play best? Did he play better in that spread system they had now? Was he better in that power system? Is he more of a zone blocker, gap blocker? Uh, is he such a good athlete? But he also, I thought, I, I watched him close up in one-on-ones at the senior ball. I thought he showed a really good anchor, too, uh, to show off his strength. So where do you think he played his best football in terms of how Wisconsin was using him? I think his his best strength would be at guard and, a, and more of a, a power system. And then he can be that polar for you. And I, I think that's something that almost becoming kind of a lost art where the, that pulling guard comes around and it has to block, you know, either an inside linebacker that's kind of screaming from the inside and scraping over the top or that outside linebacker that's crashing down and trying to collapse the hole. He, he's shown the ability to do both of those things. Uh, I mentioned the snap issues at center, but I just think overall giving him a little bit more of a, an angle with some of his blocks as opposed to the head-up blocks that he would have to uh, with some one techniques one techniques in the NFL, that'd be a little bit more of a challenge for him. Uh, I think that guard would be his best spot if he had kind of his druthers, but I think he knows that positional versatility, especially on the interior, is how you stay in the NFL, right? You've got to be able to jump into center if they need you to. So if I, I think if he had to pick, he would play guard, but I think he's kind of selling himself as that guy that can do both for you and be that, if he doesn't start right away, be that sixth lineman that's a backup for two or three spots. Yeah, that's a very valuable position in the NFL. You could ask the New York Giants if we had that nice six lineman this year or how good we'd have been. Right. So I'm looking at the, the list of uh, uh, potential uh, draft prospects from Wisconsin, and I know the name Jametta, uh, the linebacker you guys had. Braylon Allen said that was the hardest he's been hit through his whole college career in practice by him. Uh, what's his potential, and is there any guy from the, any, one of, any one of these prospects from the list that you think will get la- uh, drafted and have an NFL career? Yeah, I think for Muma Jamed, as the linebacker you mentioned, he's going to have to be uh, kind of a situational, uh, I-, I think, run-stopper type of linebacker. I just don't think that speed-wise he's going to have what you need to cover a lot of space in the NFL. But if you're just talking about downhill, attacking a football and attacking the run game, that was his biggest strength uh, throughout his college career. And he got better and better as his career went along. He became a starter as a junior, had a really good season, led the team in tackles. And then this past season when they changed the defense, tried to bring in some more 3-3-5 elements with Mike Trestle, the new defensive coordinator, I think being asked to play in more space hurt some of his um, you know, chances on the field, and we saw him not play quite as much in the middle of the year. Uh, I think that if a team sees him as you know a first and second down type of player and it kicks him off the field in the sub packages, I think that's kind of his role in the NFL. Uh, I just don't think he's going to be that every down guy. And maybe he develops into that. Maybe he gets a little bit faster. We've seen Leo Chanel with the Chiefs, obviously a bigger body and a, a better athlete overall. But a guy that's starting to develop into being able to be on the field a little bit more with the same profile as a run stopper. But in terms of other guys, I like. I, I don't know if he's going to get drafted. I, I, I 
because of his uh, last season here at Wisconsin where he wasn't super productive. But I think quarterback Tanner Mordecai had a really good pro day. He ran like a 4 4 5, yeah, 4 5, well. 40. He tested really well. And I think he, the, the power that he showed throwing the ball in his pro day, where there was enough of a break where he was able to actually get his arm a little bit rested, he broke his hand against Iowa here at Wisconsin. And that was a, an injury that a lot of guys wouldn't have tried to play through because his grip was not as strong as it needed to be, I think, a lot of times, uh, especially toward the end of the season. But he made it work. And I think that his athleticism, his smarts, and then just that, that will and that competitiveness, I don't know if he's ever going to be an NFL starter, but I think he's got an NFL career as a backup uh, just because I think the the ability to read defenses as quickly as you need to and then fire the ball down the field, and especially on some of these out routes that were kind of a bread-and-butter thing for this team last year, uh, those were NFL throws, and I just I think he's going to catch on and get a chance once somebody gets him into a building. I just don't know if somebody's going to spend draft capital on him this season. Colden, good stuff, my friend. We appreciate the time today. Anytime, guys. Thank you. Colden Bartholomew, Badgers beat reporter for Badger Extra, the Wisconsin State Journal, and Madison.com. That's all the time we have for Big Blue Kickoff Live right here on Giants.com and the Giants mobile app. Thanks for being with us. Giants.com slash tickets for season tickets, folks, or download Giants TV, the Giants streaming television app. And of course, make sure you continue to check out all of our coverage of the draft and Giants Huddle podcast. And next week we'll be live. We'll have a bunch of other details on our programming for the draft next week as well. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back tomorrow for another episode of BBKL at 1230. JC, good job, my man. We'll see you then. Have a great night, everybody. 